welcome to Sussex Street Christian Centre's Reflection Series on the Gospel of Mark. We hope you are blessed by them as they aid you in your growth and depth of relationship with God, as well as inspire you to action and service for the coming of his kingdom. Today, we are going to be focusing on Mark chapter 14, verses 53 to 65, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. Jesus before the Sanhedrin. They took Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests, the elders and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guard and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him. But their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy the temple made with human hands and in three days will build another, not made with hands. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, Prophesy! And the guards took him and beat him. The history of respectability, Christian respectability, is a strange one. When we read the Gospels or letters from the Apostles to provinces, we aren't told or given any image where we are welcomed respectfully. We are, at most, tolerated. After Jesus' resurrection and ascension, for 380 years nearly, there were very few Christians. They were considered a risk and threat to the governing powers and often used as scapegoats. For example, in AD 64, Emperor Nero diverted attention from his own failings by scapegoating the Christians in Rome for what is known as the Great Fire. What he did was torture the Christians in Rome by executing them, either by crucifixion, throwing them into pits with wild animals, or burned them alive as living torches in the streets as a warning. Being a Christian wasn't acceptable or respectable. Those who were Christians lived in fear and danger. It wasn't until AD 313 that Emperor Constantine issued an edict which made Christianity acceptable and ten years later it became the religion of the Roman Empire. And this is the first time in Christian history, in the church's history, that religion and government or politics had joined forces. Now this made Christianity accepted and respectable in the people's eyes. However, as it was the empire's religion, you were obliged to submit to it. Now this was good for a time, but power is an addictive thing. The temptation of control became an issue. Although Christianity grew as a result, it also had a negative effect which led to its misuse, opened it up to heresies and error. If you know anything about the Reformation, which happened roughly 1300 years later, 
you will see that it wasn't just the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. It was freedom from the controlling tyranny of lords, magistrates, monarchies, and the middleman known as the Pope of Roman Catholicism, which is where we Baptists and other reformed traditions originate. And yet there is an argument that these traditions started before the reformation of Martin Luther. Christianity throughout its history has always sought respectability and it's understandable. Who wouldn't want to be accepted? Who wouldn't want to be free from persecution? Who wouldn't want safety to worship? Now there's much to be thankful for in 2021. However, when we look at today's passage, if we were to look back, Christ certainly wasn't respected. Christ certainly was not free from persecution. Christ certainly wasn't free to worship God. We see God himself, God in flesh, suffering. We see God himself suffering what we could so easily experience, speaking out in many public places of industry or the town square in today's world. He, God in the flesh, the incarnation, the son of God spoken about in Daniel chapter 7 was subjected not only to shackles and chains but an unfair and unjust trial. He was blasphemed, he was slandered, mocked, beaten and spat at and later sentenced to death for speaking truth, sharing hope, demonstrating love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness and ultimate self-control. There is a German philosophy called the Zeitgeist. Some of you may have heard of it, some of you may not have. The Zeitgeist roughly translates to English as the spirit of the age and this could be used and plugged into the situation that might explain the workings of the hearts of the people of Jesus' time as well as our own. At, the, at that time the spirit of the age revolved around Rome and their governance and also Jewish religious law. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 5 and 6, Paul says, Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, meaning the law, but the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now this letter that kills was legalism. What Paul is talking about, the spirit, is the spirit of freedom and life that is found in the letter, not the legality. What is the letter of law today? What is the spirit of the age today? Liberalism, critical race theory or CRT, secularism, political correctness, this idea of hate speech, whatever that is or however it is defined. What is being challenged today? What is considered unlawful or worthy of cancelling due to differences of opinion? You know, freedom of religion and expression, objective truth, whose truth? Religious symbolism, the use of religious symbolism, free speech. I believe a time is coming when we will be presented with a choice, honour man or honour and serve God. There is a saying, choose your battles wisely or is this a mountain worth dying on? What will be your mountain to stand for Jesus and fight and risk it all for him? Is respectability an essential thing? Having said that, Paul does urge us to respect and honour leaders and government and yet Paul, Peter and other followers of Jesus deliberately disobeyed laws that conflicted with God's commands. They still submitted to the authorities by accepting their actions as legal consequences. Now this isn't a new concept. If we were to consider Exodus, 
we read that the Hebrew midwives refused to carry out the Pharaoh's repugnant order to murder newborn babies. The first people who worshipped Jesus were a band of three pagan astrologers from Asia. In the first record of civil disobedience in the New Testament, they deliberately disobey King Herod's orders, an offence punishable by death. Jesus himself broke the Sabbath law by healing. The disciples themselves ended up in prison at some point or excommunicated. So the question is, should the law be our ultimate moral guide as Christians? Because after all, looking back at our history, slavery was lawful for a time, for a long time. The Holocaust was legal. Segregation and apartheid were legally sanctioned. The law does not and should not dictate our ethics. God should. What things today are considered law and yet they're unjust when taken from a spirit-guided and inspired biblical Christian ethic? When we look at when Paul talks about honouring authorities, the way to interpret Romans 13 as Peter and Paul meant, if we break an unjust law to highlight and protest its injustice, we should be willing to submit to the punishment for violating such laws so that we demonstrate our respect for the role of government in general. That has major implications. A time is coming, I fear sooner rather than later, when we, as followers of Christ, will be called upon to stand up with a holy and resounding no in the face of evil and injustice. Jesus took the punishment for supposedly breaking laws, but he was fulfilling the law. How are we to obey and fulfill the law and run the risk of losing our respectability for the gospel and justice today? Oh,